The Second Renaissance by Joseph Leterio Prelude, The Light in the Darkness The ground was cold under his feet. A miserably weary man stumbled through the forest, like a mortally wounded deer fleeing a hunter, seeking some hidden glade in which to expire of its own choosing. He could barely feel his fingers under the drenched linen cloak. The still dry wool tack lining protecting his cargo was the only source of comfort. It was for that ancient relic that he ran. Another terrifying flash, another thunderclap. It stormed so often as of late, probably the conjuring of some pagan warlock. Could the enemy know? Surely his errand was blessed, desperate as it was. Nothing seemed certain any more, nothing truly true. His life was forfeit, fealty betrayed, his family slain, no justice or time for revenge, his name disgraced, a noble fugitive. He had been a knight once, sworn to defend the holy and the innocent. All had changed but his oath. The darkness changed shape. The world around him turned upside down. And with a sudden thud, he felt a rock hit his face. No cry to be heard or agony perceived. A momentary daze shaken off by determination. The root that he tripped over was made briefly visible by another lightning flash, as was the blood now streaming from his right cheek. How utterly alone he felt, completely abandoned. Were there no angels to speed him, no end to this miserable storm? As he staggered to his feet, he caught sight of something in the distance. A gentle light, not of the storm pierced the utter night around him. He wiped the mixture of blood, mud, and rainwater from his eyes and took another look. It flickered but stayed, the one constant. A beacon called him to what he knew not. He stumbled on for half a league and came upon a stone tower. He looked upon a similar symbol of hope, its two beams carved into the single wooden door in front of him. He could not know what would happen next, but saying a prayer of confidence, he knocked three times and awaited his fate. The door opened, revealing an elderly man dressed in the garb of the Order of Benedict. He spoke in a calm but piercing voice. Only a truly desperate or madman would come to my tower in such a storm as this. Are you alone? More weakened than he had realized, the fugitive stammered. I seek the sanctuary of our Lord from enemies of both this world and the other. The monk nodded understandingly and ushered him in. Chapter 1 At last, a moment to read what I have written. The Fletcher scoffs at my writings. He says they are a distraction, a waste of precious time. Perhaps they are a distraction. So much has changed but some things remain the same. They said it was writing that gave ancient man prosperity and stability. Then they said it was unnecessary, an excessive pastime for the privileged to feel lofty about themselves. We had the internet then, something hard to describe to the young of this present generation. With the tap of a few plastic squares or the stroke of a piece of glass, one could find the answer to almost any question. A magic screen that made scholars or zombies out of men. I remember. I was more than a child when it happened. In an instant, completely unexpected, all that we had taken for granted was taken away. What makes a people privileged? Is it the amount of comforts they possess, or the feeling of being first in a herd of lemmings charging towards a cliff? Comforts can become shackles, and alphas are often cut first cut down. What makes a people one? Is it a word? For a good long time, the word was freedom. But the meaning of that word had been forgotten, or rather perverted, until it became an emptying rally cry, doomed to die away when real tribulation struck. Is it the name that they give themselves, or the color of the flag that they salute? A name can mean many things and colors wash away in rain or burn in a sudden wildfire. In the years prior to the great blackout, so many of the privileged 
or rather the materially successful, were just as wearied by the rat race of the mechanized state of things as were those members of society who were usually looked down on with disappointment or pitied without empathy. Both groups were being gradually corralled into a single state of miserable existence by irresponsible government policies summed up as hyperinflationary. For some time we had overheard our parents bemoaning the way public education, a concept only some 200 years in the testing, had been failing our peers, failing by passing with no standards, no anchor, leaving so many unprepared and foundationless. When a new option became available, a new choice, a new type of education called charter schools, our parents jumped at the opportunity. These schools allowed more flexibility in how they were run, allowing and encouraging the needs of students to be met on the ground rather than going through an overburdened and outdated bureaucracy. Each could have its own focus, say in the arts or trades guilds. The school we chose had a focus in core cultural knowledge. My sisters and I had to wait a year, as the demand was so much greater than the supply, a concept I wouldn't have learned at the normal school before 12th grade or even college. When we were finally enrolled, it changed our lives, gave us hope that we could be competitive in a global marketplace. It gave us tools. But my thoughts stray. I don't have long to read. A baby hummingbird came for breakfast, delighted me with her presence. I must find pleasure in such simple things. I am afraid. We are all afraid. Something has happened. It happened in the middle of the second period physics class. We were observing the reaction between two elements when heated. I was about to note which ones, when there was a popping sound from the smart board and the tablet for everything. The light went out, but it was sunlit enough outside. For a moment it was tensely silent, until Monica shrieked with a cuss that her cell had gotten hot and wouldn't turn on. We heard Mr. Peters yell down the hall something about his instruction time being interrupted. The door opened, and Headmaster Joan walked in and whispered something to Dr. Ross. This was the closest classroom to the high school office, so we figured she must be making rounds to each classroom as she calmly closed the door on her way out. No one interrupted as our favorite teacher explained to us that something had happened and that we had temporarily lost power. Headmaster Joan was telling the other teachers and we would have a silent fire drill when everyone was ready. Monica asked nervously how the power going out could have affected her smartphone. He said he didn't know, but it could be karma for her having it on in class, and the mood lightened a bit. As we joined in with the other classes on our way out to the stadium, I think most of us were kind of glad that we would have an early release on a particularly nice mid-spring Virginia day. But as we started noticing that every one of our smartphones were dead, we started whispering quietly at first, then I felt the butterflies growing in my stomach. When we were all assembled, we received a vague debriefing of our situation and listened attentively to our instructions. We are finally at the safe house. That was the longest walk, or march rather, that most of us have ever experienced, an entire day from dawn till dusk, with our backpacks overloaded, not with books, but all kinds of tools and supplies of which we might not have even noticed were at school. More than that, thanks to the two en route convenience store owners who believed our story before most others had any clue of what was really happening. One of the owners had a son in the fourth grade at our grammar school and was thus delighted to see us all together, though dismayed at the possible implications explained by our resource officer, who is now in charge of our entire group security force. The other was just a friend of an 8th grader's family. Now we have enough water and non-perishable food to last at least a couple weeks if we share it wisely, but there is so much to be done in precious little time. Immediate preparations have been made. That was intense, exhausting, and somehow exciting work. We have built a temporary structure that some are calling the longhouse, though much to my disappointment we haven't managed to include a center hearth as the ancient Vikings used to have. We had to cut down a bunch of pine trees, 26 exactly, 
from the edge of the woods surrounding Headmaster Jones' house. This is where we are sleeping, and where we are staying, for now at least. There were three stop-off locations along the way. Big enough houses owned by student families, but this one was considered the ultimate safe house, and the destination of our bug-out march. She has a home library, go figure, full of old books that they collected at various yard sales over the years. We are finding that quite useful now, particularly the old Boy Scout manuals and Woodland Survival books. I've heard that we are going to have mandatory reading circles each night to brush up on old skills long forgotten. I haven't had time for browsing just yet, as I just sat down to write this note. I'm on waterhall duty. At the end of my last note, I reported that I was on waterhall duty. That was tedious work, and pulled many of us away from other tasks that needed to be done. We now have a system of ropes and pulleys through trees and down the hill, all the way to the river. It is much better. Thank God we have a river nearby. There are so many of us, and we need constant hydration for all the work that most of us are just getting used to. No one has gotten sick yet, probably because Dr. Ross insists on us treating the water we pull in with little bits of iodine or by boiling. I should say no one who doesn't have diabetes. Tommy from 7th grade and Miss Sander have it bad and have been really struggling ever since the march. Nurse Robbins and Dr. Roberts, who just happened to be visiting his daughter Molly from 3rd grade for lunch that day, are doing all they can it seems, but it's a constant struggle to keep the insulin cool enough from going bad. Fortunately, no one else has it so severe, but I'm worried about Tommy and Miss Sander. On a lighter note, we've managed to have some fun. On our breaks and during restless nights, we've thought up a couple new games and rediscovered some old ones. Also, students taking music were allowed to bring along an instrument each, and athletes came dressed out for a game during the entire bug out. With equipment and all, I fell in both categories since I played viola and defensive lineman on the football team. Thanks to Miss Joan, my viola is with me as well. There was good reason for us to hike it 25 miles wearing heavy football gear, baseball gear, karate gis, and soccer cleats. Though I had my sweaty complaints along the way, I'm certainly glad we did. It was for protection, or at least the least to leave an impression of physical strength on those many timid and newly desperate onlookers as a school parade of almost 1,000 children of all ages and 100-ish adults came walking by, laden with supplies and an apparent plan of direction. The people still clinging to their defunct electric cars were undoubtedly still waiting for someone else to come and rescue them without much thought given to the unthinkable. But there were many envious eyes focused on our full backpacks, I noticed two groups of men, perhaps neighbors, following behind us about five miles apart when the afternoon sun was beating down hardest and rash emotions take hold. Only when Officer Moody brought us to a halt and the rear guard of which I was a part returned the staring, bats and such in hand, did the men both times shake their heads and turn back away. We are the security of the group. Bravo Company, we are called, based on the emergency bug-out plan. There are over 150 of us athletes, with the addition of three non-athlete 12th graders, hand-picked by Colonel Moody, and seven volunteering teachers. We are divided into seven platoons, each answering to its respective teacher or captain. Each platoon is divided into patrol squads of three or four. Somehow I got picked as sergeant of my squad. Jordan, Cameron, and Lucas are my squad buddies. Jordan is a year behind me on the football team. Cameron is one of our soccer strikers. And Lucas is our baseball shortstop. I'm awake early this morning. There were many strange sounds coming from the woods during the night, and I didn't get much sleep. At the reading circle, Mr. Tallett, our AP Human Geography teacher, former Marine, and somewhat of our de facto operations leader, said that we should do an outreach mission 
some of our neighbors within walking distance. Of course, walking distance can now mean 25 miles, but he narrowed it down to more like 5 or 10, depending on our success. Up until now, it's been all about our group making frantic preparations for shelter and basic hygiene needs. This is the first time that we are going to intentionally approach other people and try to convince them to work together with us. My squad, which we've called the Pathfinders, is one of the squads accompanying each of the initial ambassadors. Ours is to make a left out of the driveway and head down the road in a northwest direction. We are to greet anyone that we see outside non-threateningly and wait for Mrs. Gordon, fifth grade history teacher and our ambassador, to explain the situation and to negotiate a partnership. We are to be unarmed for this mission. Things are crazy right now, but I just had to write a follow-up to this morning's note. Our mission went well. No one shouted us away or sent dogs after us. We have a tentative agreement with the owner of the apple orchard 20 minutes walk down the road, which is apparently a big deal. We will send manpower, no details yet, to help guard his orchard, and he will allow us to take as many apples as we need once they ripen. Half of the homes we visited seem to be vacant, but two families, each armed with shotguns when we met them, agreed to come talk to us tomorrow afternoon at the Stronghouse. Mr. Tallett and his squad have not returned yet, and we're trying to figure out what to do. He left instructions in case of this situation, but they included him leading the rescue team. It's been two days. Lacey, Samuel, and Javon are back with us, but Mr. Tallett is still missing. A neighbor, Mary Whitesides, who is now part of our group, pointed us in the direction that they had gone after visiting her. A little more than 15 minutes from the stronghouse and up a dirt road that Mary had mentioned belonging to a creepy guy, we found the three of them tied up and gagged inside a tool shed beside a small house. No one else was there, so we had no problem freeing them once we found them, which we may not have if it weren't for Mr. Tallett's notes, insisting on searching all such places as tool sheds and campers. The squad has told us what happened, with Javon doing most of the talking. After having convinced Mary to join our group, along with her Colt 45 pistol and German Shepherd, Tallett's squad had headed southwest down the road in the hope of negotiating with a horse farm three miles further when they were waved at by a middle-aged man wearing a black t-shirt and blue jeans. He told them his name was Freddy and asked if they had seen his girlfriend who worked some ten miles down from the way they had come. When they told him they had not, he gave a quick frown and then invited them up to his house for some sweet tea. No ice, unfortunately. Mr. Tallett seemed hesitant, but he agreed to talk over tea when he saw the excited looks on the three young faces. They had followed Freddy up to his house, Tallett in front, and set themselves down at the neatly made table that seemed to be the only thing in the house to be neatly made. Freddy gave them each a glass, filled them with water and sugar, and seemed to be listening intently as Mr. Tallett explained that they had experienced a likely electromagnetic pulse blast, natural or man-made. It was time for neighbors to stop waiting for help and to work together to help themselves. He frowned a couple times and grinned a couple times before telling the group that they were just what he was waiting for and that he would love to join up with the rest of the group, which Tallett had curiously said was only a dozen from his church youth group. He said it was a shame that such a friendly group of kids and one really nice guy didn't have any protection. He said that he would be happy to help and that his magnum pistol would solve all their problems. He had it in his bedroom dresser and would be right back to show it to them. Mr. Tallett stood up immediately, which seemed to startle Freddy, and said that they were most grateful and would love to see the piece. The host seemed to fumble for a good reason that they should wait at the table, but Tom, as he suddenly referred to himself in the first name, steadily offered his right hand in friendship, and with his left, patted Freddy on the shoulder as the two men walked calmly to retrieve the pistol together. As they opened the bedroom door, there came a sudden commanding shout from within, 
Get back or I'll blow your damn head off. The three kids got up immediately as Tom Tallett yelled for them to run, for which he was clobbered on the back of the head by Freddy, who was now holding a golf iron, while his fellow ambusher brandished the firearm. The squad halted for a moment as their leader collapsed to the floor, and they dared not do anything but follow commands, as all six eyes remained fixed on the flashing silver that could have ended all of their dreams in an instant. There was a long pause in the story, quite a bit of weeping and hugging before it continued. They were forced at gunpoint to the tool shed. They were bound and gagged, left in there for the night without food or water or any kind of relief. They could hear frequent yelling and other loud noises coming from the house where their mentor was being interrogated, surely beaten. At early dawn, they heard the two thugs storm out of the house, apparently dragging the bound and gagged gunnery sergeant along with them. They were yelling at him, every other word a curse, saying something about using the others as ransom after they made an example out of him. It was hard to listen to this. It was some time after the men left, maybe an hour, when our rescue team found them, dehydrated and robbed of youthful dignity, but alive. There is a crazy storm tonight. We are all huddled inside the Malloy's house, which I had just realized I hadn't noted as Headmaster Jones' last name. She and her husband, Mark, have been so encouraging throughout this whole situation. There may have been bigger homes we could have dispersed to, but she insisted that we should stay together as much as possible. The house is big, and the property around us seems perfectly suited to our needs. It's centered on an open hill surrounded by deep woods. We have room to meet and work and play around. I already mentioned the river, which seems to have gotten deeper. The road is far enough down the eco-stone driveway where we can see or hear any unwelcome visitors at least five minutes before they get up to the house on foot. The soil seems good, and we've already planted a lot of summer and fall crops with new ideas and plans being made around the clock. The house and area around us is very defendable. We are pretty deep in the woods, for one thing. We have the river on our northeast side and the two-lane road on our south side. The road has many curves, each of which could serve as a checkpoint, choke point, or fallback as needed. There is a stretch of two miles southeast and three miles northwest between the stronghouse and the nearest respective connection roads, connecting roads. The woods are dense enough east and west to give our scouts or if needed, ambushers, ample cover while observing any outside force large enough to overrun us. There is a large field, an old pasture, between the road and the hill on which the house is located. This would be the critical kill zone in the case of an overwhelming attack from that direction. The hill has a gradual slope on the west and east sides, the east heading to the river and the west including a a copse overlooking the old horse pasture, providing effective cover for a strategic retreat. The flat areas north and south will allow us to counterattack, and perhaps even flank climbing forces from above. The house itself is strong. It is big and made of stone and treated wood. Three stories with windows at each level, through which desperate offenders could shoot and throw. The roof has a wide flat area that gives a perfect vantage point around the house and dozens of miles more. Inside the house, there are hallways and staircases where close-quarter combat would favor evenly matched defenders. The underground basement would serve as cover for most crude artillery-like assaults, assuming the attackers didn't have advanced explosive ordinances. Several neighbors have joined us over the past couple days. The Plank family followed us back to the safe house after the rescue. Lacey, Jay, and Sam are okay. Todd Plank had been lined up for a job interview at a bank the day of the blackout. He and his wife Susan have two daughters. Ron Burke had been on disability for three years after complications from a concussion gave him chronic epilepsy. Brittany Evans was home from college for a couple days taking care of her parents' five dogs while they were at a conference. Ironically, their lack of neighborly relations seemed to have led their daughter and 
babies to be part of our little commune. The babies are fine sentries, and Brittany appears strangely sure of her folks' safety, wherever they are. Brian Foley was home, sick with a mild case of SARS, while his mom was at work. He keeps asking for us to go look for her. Dr. Roberts is determined Brian is no longer contagious, and we now have an increased supply of antibiotics. Todd Barber, a retired mechanic, joined us today. He brought some old tools and a compound bow with hunting arrows, which we have been wanting more of from the start. At this point, we think that every friendly neighbor who was home at the time or within safe walking distance has either agreed to help us or is holding out. There is talk among the squad leaders as to what we should do about the nearby empty homes. We don't want to be looters, but we can't waste an opportunity to acquire supplies and non-perishable food. Sooner or later, someone is going to take whatever is left unclaimed. Mr. Tallet is back. He staggered into our northwestern checkpoint around noon. The council has been meeting ever since, while we Bravo folks have been working on the fortifications. It was decided at the reading circle two nights ago that we need to be better prepared to defend ourselves. We had seen thick smoke rising from the south, and a book that we were reading one second after had given us a chilling account of what we might expect from a similar situation as our own should organized gangs start pillaging the countryside. I think we all shudder at the thought of what things might be like right now in the cities. So many people compacted in, in an area with little natural resources, always taking for granted that grocery shelves would be stocked and their garbage disposed of. We've talked out loud in optimistic tones about the way people tend to band together in difficult situations. After all, that's what we did, but we had known each other. We were a school. The council horn just sounded. Maybe we will finally hear how Mr. Tallet escaped. On the morning that our three students were left neglected and subsequently rescued, Gunnery Sergeant Tom Tallett expected that it would be his last. He was being dragged by two men, one armed with a magnum pistol and the other with a crowbar. After a night of aggressive interrogation, details of which he would not share with any of us, the captors were convinced he was leading them to the rest of the group. He was hurt badly, but his training had taught him how to deal with the situation. His mind was clear. He had a responsibility. Foremost in his mind were the three student escorts that he had not protected well enough. He had been caught off guard by the second assailant. He should have acted sooner, but that was in the past. Now his mission had changed. There was no way he would put the whole school in danger, even if Freddy and Vic were expecting only a handful of students. That deception was meant to put Freddy at ease enough to reveal his true intent quickly, and it worked. But neither could he allow himself to be killed while his squad was still held captive. He would do what he had to do, what he promised himself and God many years before that he would never do again. He won't say more for now, only that those two psychos are no longer a threat. Major, Dusk Patrol reports some activity alerted to you by the dogs at the southern perimeter. Command wants us to back them up. After all these years, Cameron really doesn't need to address me as his superior, especially when no one else is around, but he has always been respectful of office. Thank you, Captain. We will group at the villa gate. My old friend nodded and left to round up his men. The tree that has become my favorite spot for reading and reflection is starting to look older than I perceive it should be, having planted it myself shortly after the blackout. The moss that is growing up around its trunk adds to the intrigue. It also provides welcome comfort to bare feet after riding horseback as long as I did the last three days. The formalization of a treaty is a slow process now, as it always had been until it had been taken for granted for a couple hundred years. Sure, we have restored the ability to use radio, but we have learned the lesson of how dangerous that can be without knowing who is listening. 
and we now use it only as a last resort. The trip was worth it. The mission a success. The town of Danville has become an important trading partner, as well as a reliable source of information regarding happenings in the Carolinas. Ever since the sacking of Roanoke to the north, we have doubled our reconnaissance efforts in order to assist our neighbors in the future and also to gain an early warning of any mounting threats to our own security. We still don't know much factual information regarding the state of our former capital, but enough rumors and whispers of horror stories have come from grief-maddened wanderers to give us reason for caution and preparation. This has been a pilot reading from the Second Renaissance. More to come. <laughs>